us online via Twitter and Facebook. And at Life Changes with Filippo.com. That's Filippo, M-I-L-I-P-P-O. Well, we're back. And our guest today, at the age of nine, was developing the basis for a unified hyperdimensional theory of matter and energy, which he eventually called the hollow fractographic universe. Nassim Haramin, our guest today, has spent most of his life researching the fundamental geometry of hyperspace, studying a variety of fields from theoretical physics, cosmology, quantum mechanics, biology and chemistry, to anthropology and ancient civilizations. Combining this knowledge with a keen observation of the behavior of nature, he discovered a specific geometric array that he found to be fundamental to creation and the foundation for his unified theory, of which he is most famous for. That's how the theory emerged. Please help me welcome to the show, Nassim Harami. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. It's great to finally connect with you. Yes. When I first saw a DVD of you about three or four years ago, uh -huh. I said, look at this man. He's young. He's, uh, he's uh, charismatic. He's, uh, you were very clear in the way you described things. You had long hair and you're handsome. I thought, how could it be this man is just like me? <laughs> Maybe it's the Italian blood. It's the Italian blood. <laughs> right. Well, yeah, uh, thank you for all the <laughs> I don't know if they were for you or for me, but in any event. Um, no, but seriously, the interesting thing is that I've studied physics both in high school, in, in college, and at the university. Uh -huh. And I can't say that I understood all of that. But in watching just a few minutes of, of your video, of how you played with the theories, Right. And, and how you came to them right. helped me understand it probably more in, in those few minutes than all the years. So how does a, a kid at nine years old get interested in physics? Well, actually I didn't know it was physics. I was just interested in, interested in understanding the universe. To me, you know, that was the main thing. I mean, if I was going to be down here, alive in this world, I had to understand how I got here and what this was all about. To me, that was the main thing. And, you know, that's why I was, you know, some, not so interested at school with all the rest of stuff that seemed pedantic to me. And, you know, I wanted to know the, the juicy stuff. Like, what is this? What is consciousness? How will life work? So I was really kind of, you know, observing nature and trying to figure it out from really early on. Now, obviously the teachers didn't have the answers. As a matter of fact, nobody had the answers. Right. I realized that there was, you know, very little answers out there and many questions that were not addressed or not even posed, you mm -hmm. know, and, and that people just went through life seemingly not, um, you know, inquiring about what is life and what is, how did I get here, you know? It's yeah. kind of strange to me and it was strange when I was young. It's like... Imagine like all of a sudden you were deported to another planet far away from here and it was completely different and when you arrived there you didn't uh, you know ask question on how you got there you just got into the flow and just went with it to me it was a little bit like that it's like wait you know how did we get here what is this dimension we live in what is this world and how does it work and, and why am I conscious in it it, that actually was my question. Why were you conscious in it? In the sense that, how did you, did, are you saying you came with this understanding that you weren't from here or that something... Not necessarily, but just that it seemed that like, um, there was like, like this experience um, it was, is not, uh, you know, like a, the, the, the capacity to, to question your existence, the capacity to be here, to to like observe the world and wonder where it comes from right. must be there for a reason. There must be an answer to that question. To me, that was like crucial to understand. And, and I just didn't understand why people weren't spending all their time, you know, trying to figure that out. To me, it was like, okay, let's start with that. If we've wow. got that figured, then maybe the rest of this stuff is going to flow better and, and maybe we'll get more harmonious with nature if we understand it better, if we understand ourselves better. I'm with you. At nine years old, I was thinking the same thing. I wish we knew each other back then. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I we got to write some nice <laughs> physics together. No, I wasn't thinking that, but 
But here, here you were in your thought process. You found was it a ball that you started with saying, okay, it's wrap. What was it? The, the primary thing that said, okay, this is the first thing. Well, uh, when I was about nine years old, I went to um, you know at school. There was the first lesson in geometry, and that really kind of got me thinking because uh, the teacher talked about dimensions that day and, and went through the iteration of the point, the line, you know, the plane and the cube, right. uh, making our three dimensions. And, and to me, it was some fundamental uh, misunderstanding there that, that that axiom was not complete, meaning that he started with a point that has zero dimension and that he's, you know, he expressed as non-existent because it didn't enclose volume and then he made a line out of those non-existent dots that still didn't enclose volume and then he made a, a plane out of those, uh, out of four lines that still didn't enclose volume and all of a sudden he made a cube out of those planes right. that supposedly enclosed volume and was called the third dimension and that one existed. but. If the dot didn't exist, that made the line that right. doesn't exist, that made non-existing plane. I don't care if you slap 10,000 of them together, you're not going to get existence. Nothing from nothing gets nothing. Right, so for me, it was like, there must be a solution to this. And it was really crucial that I understood how it works. And, and so that night, I came home and I had this long bus ride and I thought about it like really deeply in that, during that time. And, and I came to a solution. Uh, it, it was kind of a vision kind of, you know, visualization moment where I realized that like if I extruded myself from the bus and, and floated above the bus far enough, the bus would, like, would look like a dot. And then if I rose further, the, uh, you know, the city I was in would look like a dot. If wow. I rose further, the earth would start looking like a dot, you know? Wow. And then the galaxy or the, the solar system would start looking like a dot and then the galaxy and so on. And then I flew back in and I, I opened my eyes and I thought, I wonder what my hand is made of. I knew at the time, I think, that it was made out of cells. So I closed my eyes and I visualized and I, I, I thought, I, you know, that there would be millions and millions of cells. And then, and then I flew onto the surface of one of the cells and looked really, really carefully and it opened up into billions of little stars that are atoms. Wow. And then I flew into one of those and I looked in the middle and sure enough there was a dot, you know, and I thought, wow, it's dots all the way down too. Right. So it's like the axiom needs to be reversed. It's the exact reverse concept is that every dot contains all the information. You can divide it to infinity. The dot is the only thing that exists. Wow. You know where I went with that when I first saw it in, in the video was that if everything outside of me uh, is, is all these dots and everything inside of me to infinity is all these dots then I am the center of the universe. That's right, that's right, in the fractal. Thank you. I, why does nobody believe me? Why <laughs> not you believe me? Yeah, well, there's one thing that's really important oh, when what? you realize that, is that you realize that everybody else is the center as well. Oh. Yeah, otherwise you oh, could oh, run into Well, that's problems. our show for today. <laughs> <laughs> Especially with your partner. Yeah. Uh, so it, it's really, um, yeah, it's really an amazing thing when you start to think of the universe as this fractal division of the structure of space itself, then uh, a whole new world and a whole new way of relating to nature and the universe as a whole opens up. Like mm. you start to realize that you're part of this amazing will work of, of nature and that you know that it, it is all embedded within each other and that you can't isolate anything from everything else. You, when you look at something, you have to consider that thing in the, in the context of everything else in the mm -hmm. universe. You can't isolate it and, and that's a big problem that we've been doing in physics for a long time. Is we have a tendency to isolate systems, so for instance, all of our laws of motion and thermodynamics and entropy and conservation laws start with this sentence within a closed system. Mm. But if you look up in a physics uh, dictionary closed systems, you'll find that 
the first sentence in there will say no such thing has ever been found, right? Because you can't isolate anything from all gravitational fields or electromagnetic fields and so on. So actually, you know, everything is interconnected in this really deep relationship. And this is the relationship I wanted to understand. Mm. You know, actually, uh, I don't know if this it plays part of your theory, but if you're talking about something scientific like that, if we bring it back to us, both two centers of the universe here, mm -hmm. we're having a conversation right mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. How are we, you're saying we're affecting so many other things. Right. Uh, how are we connected and how are we affecting other things? Right. Well, the space between, this is one of the realization I, I found early on, is that the assumption that space is empty is, a, is probably incorrect. That space is not empty but actually completely full of energy and it is actually what mediates all the information in the universe and is the source of the material world. That is, the space between me and you is not empty. The space between your atoms and your molecules is not empty. The space inside the atom is not empty. And the atom is 99.9999999% space. So wow. everything you see in this universe that you call the material world, including your body, is mostly space. And so I, I came to realize that maybe we had this reverse, that we thought of matter defining the space, but actually it's space that defines matter. Oh wow. And if wow. you start to look at it that way, like if you start to look at our, the space between you and me right now as being full, right. and as, in, as exchanging information, and the fact that you're in exchanging information with that space currently that all the atoms in our bodies it is giving information to the space and the space is giving information back to the atom in this continuous feedback you start to realize it's like a whole the whole universe is a learning structure learning about itself through the media of what we call space wow there's more space here than there is what looks like you and i that's right so could it be that the space is almost more important? Right, it's the space that defines the structure instead of the other way around. Wow. And when you look in quantum theory then, when I was doing physics later on, I realized, wait a minute, we actually found that, but we put it in a closet almost a hundred years ago. That is that when we looked at the space inside the atom in quantum theory, in quantum field theory, we found that all the modes of oscillations um, you know, add up and there's, and that there's infinite amount of oscillations of the space inside the atom. The structure of space-time in and inside and near the atom are, is fluctuated mm. with almost infinite amount of energy. Alright, so that means that space not only is not empty, but it's actually infinitely full of energy, which we renormalize with uh, the Planck's um, you know, uh, the Planck's units in order to cut off the number so we get a finite number. Mm -hmm. and even So we can work with it. Yeah, so we can work mm -hmm. with it. But even when we get a, a finite number, the number is enormous. It's 10 to the 94 grams per centimeter cube. It's a huge mm -hmm. number. And it's, it's, uh, it's more than if I took all the stars in the universe and stuck them into a centimeter cube of space. So it's not trivial. Wow. And we're swimming in this all the time we're made out of that stuff and when you start to realize that the material world is actually space in the knot basically an mm -hmm. atom is a little vortex in the structure of space then you start to realize you're interacting with the field that everything is interacting with the field and it is in constant flux with that field mm -hmm. and, and you start to feel the connection between everything you start to feel the connection between all your atoms and, and all the molecules and the cells in your body and how they communicate through that field and it starts to explain a lot of things I'm really excited actually I just completed equations just now that I'm going to publish in the next few weeks yeah I heard you saying earlier like you were on a trip or something and things started to come to you well yeah and I was like on the deadline to publish um, a, a paper I've been asked to deliver an invited paper at a physics conference in Belgium and 
I, you know, had, I was solving these equations and it all came out, it all unraveled so beautifully really? um, that, yeah, I can actually show now that every proton in every atom is entangled with all other protons in the universe. And, and I map this, the mass of this um, black hole proton to all the other protons in the universe and then I map it back on, a, on its surface. So imagine, I'm going from the surface of B point, billions of times smaller than the atom, like the proton, mm -hmm. and then I, I map it you know, to all the other protons in the universe yeah. and, then, and then I come back and, and then look at the structure, the influence of all these other atoms in the universe on the surface of that proton and I get almost exactly like very, like three um, digit past the decimal accuracy on the mass of the proton. So it's like very remarkable. It's an amazing thing. Wow. And this is amazing that you're sharing this with us. It hasn't even been published yet. You heard it here, folks. Yes. For the very first time, this is exciting. It is exciting. And, and it, it really is a whole new way of looking at the physics of the universe. And that is that when you measure a proton, when you measure a particle, when you, when you're looking at an atom, you cannot assume that it is not entangled with the rest of the universe. Mm. You're, ma you're making a measurement inside the universe and the particle that you're measuring is connected to all the other particles. In the wow, universe. so if those particles are connected and you prove it like that, then of course we're all connected. That's we're right. made up of those particles and everything else is made up of those particles. Exactly, and it's just a question of actually, you know, finding the 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 doorway you know the entry point into that network and if i was to say how would we connect to that network that connects all the atoms in the universe i would say you have to go inside you have to turn your senses inward within yourself because you're going towards the infinitely small right which is right. which you contain Right? It's almost impossible for you to experience the infinity. Right. Yeah, exactly. Interesting. Mm -hmm. So if we go in, we can experience the out because... It's connected. It's all entangled. And, you know, I can mathematically prove it now. It's remarkable. Using holographic theory on the surface of protons, I can show that all protons are entangled. So it, it, it's remarkable, wow. yeah. You know, this feels like to me, when I was uh, studying um, computer science and electrical engineering at UCSD, we were given sometimes a program uh, or, or something, and then we'd have to figure out how that program was made. Mm -hmm. And then we'd figure it out. And then we'd say, aha, now we can duplicate it. Mm -hmm. It feels like to me like you figured out how this universe is made. Right, they, I mean, I think I figured out a, a portion of it and that something fundamental about it and that it is remarkable in its simplicity, meaning that like it's a simple set of rules that, they, that produce a high level of complexity, but that at the base, and you see that in nature all the time, nature uses simple set of rules and then produces incredible complexity out of it. And that's what I was looking for, you know? Mm -hmm. It's a little bit like when we thought the sun, you know, uh, the, the, the earth was in the middle of our solar system, mm -hmm. geocentric solar system. Uh, you know, it started to look like a bad hair day because we started to look at all the other planets and the way they move are relative to us. And in order for us to be in the middle, we had all these planets doing all sorts of crazy little loopity loop and all this stuff to make it, to make work. it work. Right. And so then the model of our solar system was extremely complex. Most people didn't understand it and all this stuff. And then boom, all of a sudden we realized, whoa, the sun's in the middle. When you, when you do that, all of a sudden it becomes really simple and any five-year-old can understand how the solar system works, right? Maybe you're a five-year-old, but... Right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my little guy is in the middle. <laughs> but, um, so, so you're basically trying to help people have a good hair day. Exactly. Because physics shouldn't be a bad hair day. <laughs> And, and that's a um, you know direct analogy to the, to string theory. I Is think. that in your book? I don't have a good hair. Maybe I should put it in there. Um, you know, actually, there there are are so and, and actually the word entanglement works with the hair. Exactly, right? exactly. Uh, with the theme of the hair. Yeah. So well, when we come back, 
I have so many more questions, but I, I want to make sure that we talk about all the things. I know you're going to be speaking in town and all that. We want to let everybody know about that. And I also want to know what what we can do with this today, you okay. know, between sacred geometry, like we talked to Jonathan mm -hmm. Quinton, and, you know, things, what, what we can do today to change our world even just a little bit. And I know you have answers for that. How to have a good hair day with Nassim Haramin right after this. Well, we're back with Nassim Haramin. I'm Filippo Voltaggio, and this is Life Changes with Filippo, and I feel like my life is changing, and if you want your life to change, go check out Nassim's, after hearing this interview, check out Nassim's website, theresonanceproject.org. Theresonanceproject.org, you can learn more about him and the appearances that he has coming up in this city, but also in cities throughout the world. Nassim, how does it feel to know that you are getting this information, or you're figuring it out, or, or, or it's through you that, that the world is understanding something about itself. Well, you know, it's interesting that you, that you ask, because as I'm writing these physics and I'm discovering this stuff, at the same time I'm realizing that there's not really a true me, it's like true all of us. Mm -hmm. Because this connection is occurring, like, you know, I mean, it was described as maybe the morphogenic, morphogenetic field, you know, by Childrek and, and so on, that like we're all connected through this metrical structure of space and time. And that like, it, it would not be possible for me to bring this forward if the level of consciousness and, and you know, the level of our society wasn't at that place where it could come forward. And so. I think that it's like all of us, and everybody is bringing their bit, everybody is bringing their piece, and my piece to bring is, you know, this piece about the physics, uh, the basic physics of our, of our universe. And I, you know, I, I want to say that there's always new discoveries, and, mm. you know, this is really just a little part, and then it's really a beginning, you know, a possibility, a new vector, direction, that we can take um, that I think develop a picture of the universe that's more complete and that has huge implication for people every day to understand that, to realize that, to experience that. They can, they can experience the unified field in their own life, you know. When you look at like masters, for instance, that had you know, when, when they describe their moment of illumination or their moment of realization or, or nirvana and so on, typically they describe the sensation of being one with everything. Mm. They describe mm -hmm. the sensation of adding all answers to any question, to all mm. questions and so on. Um, I think, you know, it's accessible. Anybody, and all these masters, by the way, throughout the ages, said everybody can do that. You know, they said you can do it, anybody can do it, everybody has that link. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really crucial. I mean, we may be experiencing this life so we can find that link, mm -hmm. so that we can experience that link, so that we can connect deeply with our our ancestors, if you'd like, it, our mm -hmm. source, you know, and that source has infinite potential. And so it's okay to think of ourselves as infinite beings. That is part of our existence. But even in the physical sense, and this is what I really want people to understand, this is so much, so important, so much, a lot, such a large part of my, my mission is to to make people understand that, you know, the spiritual world is not something separated from the material world. That mm -hmm. The material world is our doorway. Mm -hmm. It's it, The material world is the infinity, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. that within the material world is this infinite potential. It, it's with the material not, world, not outside of it or or in some other cloud, you know, floating somewhere, but it's actually within you, within the material existence that you have, that that link is towards infinite potential. Wow. 
Now this is outside of science and I wanted to stick to science, but you just, here's a scientist talking about spirituality mm -hmm. and that the materialism, the science is actually taking us to the doorway of that. Mm -hmm. so, so can it be said that we, there's nothing we have to do to be spiritual, we just are? That's right. This is what I'm saying is that by the mere fact that you are in the material world, you are, you know, connected to all things and you are, you know, an expression of the universe, which you could say is an expression of spirit. Wow. And so one of the largest problems in our society today is that the spiritual people tend to think we don't need the material world in this in this and the materialists, uh, like the scientists, tend to think you don't need the spiritual world, you don't need consciousness. And the fact is, is that they are intimately related to each other, and actually that there is actually no difference, meaning wow. that the material world is an expression of all information in the universe, and you could call that spirit. Well, Nassim, I, I wouldn't have expected to ask you this, but then what about what we call the negative energy, the people that are doing the bad things. Mm -hmm. That has to be in your equation somewhere. Well, you know, when I look at the equation and I try to render philosophical uh, concepts out of it, there's one thing that comes out very quickly about that idea of, um, you know, uh, negativity or uh, yeah, what you could say is, you know, evil and so on. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is that, that that doesn't exist, meaning that there is just different levels of accuracy, different levels of uh, awareness. And, and so some levels are more confused, some levels are more, uh, you know, have lower resolution, and some level have higher resolution. I'll give you an example. The math I'm writing uses holographic theory to describe the surface of event horizons of black holes, which I have mm -hmm. applied to the atomic level. Um, these um, mathematics of holography uh, can be applied as well to a holographic plate, right? Where, um, you know, a laser imprints right. on a, a photographic plate, a set of information could be an apple, Right. And it's interfered with with the second laser when the um, information is um, imprinted on the photographic plate. So you get an interference uh, wave pattern on the plate. And uh, after that, you can shoot the laser at the plate, and an apple will ha will appear in the three D space, mm -hmm. right? A hologram. Mm -hmm. Well, if you take that plate and you cut it in half and you shoot that laser at it again, you will get the apple again. Mm -hmm. And if you cut it in a quarter, you'll get the apple again. And if you cut it again and again and again, you'll still get the apple. However, every time you cut it into smaller and smaller and smaller bits, the apple gets fuzzier and fuzzier and fuzzier and fuzzier. Oh, I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. okay. and, and so you're losing resolution. And, I, and so that's the way I, I like to think about what I call confused people. And you know, when you, when you think about it, no baby is born confused. You know, babies are born with 100% resolution. But when you look at our society, when you look at what children typically go through, even in the first five minutes of their birth, we're in our birthing practice on this planet, you know, Babies are pulled out of their mother within seconds, their umbilical cord is cut while it's still pulsing. Then they're ripped away from their mother, put you know, acid in their eyes, tubes up their nose. I mean, trauma occurs dramatically, right. very quickly. And when you consider what people go through you know, in our society, in ghettos, in, in areas where you know, there's a lot of poverty, it's remarkable that there is not so much, um, you know, uh, mental uh, illness and, and difficulties and people taking arms and shooting, you know, it's remarkable that it's fairly stable, but, but uh, you start to understand that, like, basically, you know, the, the fractal structure, when we start to be disconnected from each other, when it's like we're cutting the fractal structure into smaller and smaller right. and smaller bits. 
we're getting further and further and further from the original blueprint, you know? So it gets fuzzier and fuzzier and fuzzier. And, and you know, I think that's the confusion that eventually can generate large, you know, difficulty in somebody's life. You know, this is fascinating. I'm trying to think. I think this is the very first time, except for the math that we use at the store or something, or, or to do our accounting at home, whatever. Yeah. This is the very first time that, that to me, an, an, an in-depth mathematical process mm -hmm. describes our spiritual existence. Right, and our consciousness. Our consciousness. Yeah, which is really, it's really actually the part of the, the physics I'm writing, you know, I mean, writing equations is, is it can be tedious and, and, and beautiful is at the same time because all of a sudden, you know, as you're writing these equations, all of a sudden there's moments, there's moments you, en you end up in dead end, but the, there's plenty, plenty of those, but then there's moments where it just, it just unravels and it's showing you such beauty. But, but what excites me the most is actually the philosophical application of what this is telling you, you know, and because I think that that's one of the things I really liked about you in watching it, is you related it to us. Mm -hmm. It's not just about the universe. Right. It's, it's us. It's, it's us, universe. because we're inside that yeah. universe. Because we are the universe. That's right, and we're connected to it. And so, if we're conscious, if there's self-awareness in us, mm -hmm. and it's all connected holographically, then the universe has to be self-aware. And. That, and that's what we're doing. That's right. We're, we're like an extension of the universe, like the universe extending itself, like creating fractal divisions with more and more and more and more complexity. All of nature and everything for at the end have this little being turn around and look back mm. and say, how did I get here? Mm. And what is this? And who am I? Wow. You know? And then to realize that, wow, I'm the universe looking at myself, you know? And then to realize the responsibility as well, that, that the sense of, of responsibility and awareness of like, what are you feeding the universe? What are you telling the universe is? What are you showing it? it that's right. Mm -hmm. And how is that relating, you know, to uh, your day-to-day -day life and all this? And, and it's a challenge. I mean, it's a challenge for me when I'm, you know, um, in a traffic jam and somebody cuts me off or, or, you know, just a few minutes ago when I'm surfing and somebody runs into me, or, you know, to like stay calm and, you know, however, so, so you know, this is, this is the great experience. This is the universe. When you realize that, you realize like all of nature around you is all built by this amazing complexity to support your experience that everything around you is like cheering you on it's like singing mm. your prayers you know mm. you look at all the animals they have so much respect for humans cheering you on yeah, you can almost hear it sing, you know, I mean, when you're rendering all these equations that are like all, you know, uh, harmonic equations and oscillations and all this, you, you start to hear the sound, the singing of the universe, you know. Like, oh, yeah. It's telling you you're on the right track. Right, well, or, you know, I think uh, Pythagoras um, said it the best, it's the music of the spheres, you know, and... It, it really kind of start to make you feel that part of something awesome, something mm -hmm. wonderful and, and, and something profound. And, and so now you don't feel so isolated anymore. And you start to understand how, the work, uh, how it works. What is this mechanics? It's not some esoteric, even in concept of quantum theory, where all of a sudden particles can be waves and particles and all that. When it gets that esoteric, usually it's because we haven't quite understood its mechanics. And most wow. quantum physics people will tell you that, you know, it will, you know yeah, we're missing chunks. And, and uh, I think those chunks have to do with this holographic connectivity, this, this 
you know, inter um, uh, entanglement of all the structure together. And, and when we put that in the equation, all of a sudden, it comes out beautifully. Nassim, thank you for entangling with us today. Ah, my pleasure. This has been... I, I know it's only one of a thousand interviews that we're going to do together. Yes. <laughs> I can't wait. <laughs> Infinite. Yes. <laughs> it's an amazing no, thing. We is, all learn together. This is a beautiful thing. And I love how you said how we're all coming to these things each in our own way mm -hmm. and our own place. So the fact that you're here makes me feel good about where we're all coming to in our own, our own expression. Right, and you know, I think it's so important for people to feel, to feel that and, and to follow that, you know, that path, follow that joy, to go to, you know, have the courage to go towards what makes them sing, you know, so that they can harmonize with nature and, and, uh, and, and actually, you know, uh, walk their dharma in this world, you know, because everybody has something amazing to contribute. Well, I feel like you have contributed something amazing to us here, but uh, from everything that I know about you and what I've learned and what I can't wait to learn more about ourselves through you. Thank and you. Nassim, thank you so much. It's for great. Being a great expression of, of ourselves. Thank you. It's great to have been with you. This has been a pleasure. You'll change the world.